show you the account of a gentleman by the name of Paul Tortinger. And he was a Swiss physician. And he was the <coughs> author of many books. And he gained worldwide attention because he had a very unique routine in his care for patients. In 1924, he was the assistant medical doctor at the Medical Polyclinic in Geneva. And by 1925, he had opened up his own private practice in Geneva. In 1937, he transformed his medical practice into a counseling practice. And in 1940, he published his first book entitled The Healing of Persons. Now, in his book, he advocates that man is more than just body and mind. He says that there is also a spiritual being. And so his treatments, when he dealt with patients, focused on the three. He went beyond just the mind and body, recognizing there is a spiritual aspect of man. Now, Turnier's writings, they were translated into 13 different languages, and he influenced a generation of not only medical, but religious professionals all over the world. And throughout his career, he was known for his presence, his gentle personality, his sincere demeanor, and his ability to communicate across language barriers. Now, he was also invited many times to speak in lectures at various locations, and so because of that, he traveled throughout the world. In addition to his travels, there were many doctors and different individuals who wanted to come to his home in Switzerland and to meet him and talk to him. Well, later he wrote, it's a little embarrassing for students to come over to my home to study my techniques. He said, they always go away disappointed because all I do is accept people. As I read that, I couldn't help but think about our teachings that we've been going over with the, the, the life and the teachings of Jesus. But I was also reminded of Romans 12 and verse 10. And here it says, be kindly affectionate to one another and brother with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. And here Paul speaks of a brotherly love. And this is one that seeks the highest honor for our brother over ourselves. And then I thought also of Luke 18 and the young noble who had come to Jesus asking what he may do to gain eternal life. And when Jesus told him, he went away sorrowful. Each of these things that we just discussed are not easy to do. In the Romans passage, it's very hard for us to seek the honor of another. And so often, we want to have the attention and the honors bestowed upon ourselves. And the second, the passage from Luke, we see that Jesus accepted all those who came to him. But acceptance was not the same as approval, as he told the young man what he needed to do to gain eternal life. Countless accounts show us Jesus constantly accepted people. But he also pointed out their sins in such a way as to not totally drive them away. When the young ruler left, it wasn't because of anything Jesus had said that upset him, rather than what he had said turned himself against himself. He knew what was the problem. Acceptance is an act of brotherly love. It comes from the heart, where we accept that someone else, their behavior is wrong, and yet they're still a soul, and they are loved by God. And for that, we love them too. And it can be a hard thing to do, but we can show acceptance while not condoning the sin. Think of our past lesson with Samaritan woman at the well. When she came to Jesus, Jesus accepted her. He asked her for her drink. He treated her with dignity and with respect. And yet, he also drew attention to the fact that she was living in sin. Bring your husband. Well, I have no husband. You said correctly. You've had five. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. Notice Jesus didn't just come out and condemn her. 
But he lovingly guided her to what she needed to know. He, he, in a loving way, drew her attention to something she already knew, that she was living in sin. And then he talked to her about spiritual water and how this will give her life. Notice the way he confronted her. We, when we talk to people, I've mentioned before, there are, there's a religious group out there. And what they say is not inaccurate, but the way they say it, they're not going to win any souls to Christ. Jesus accepted people, but he didn't accept that they remained the way they were when he met them. With that in mind, let's look at our teachings today of the life of Jesus. And we come to where he's along the Sea of Galilee. And this is accounted in the Synoptic Gospel in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, and Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, and in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. Now, after healing the lame man at Capernaum, Matthew simply says, as Jesus passed on from there. Matthew 9, verse 9. Luke, in Luke 5, verse 27, he says, after these things, he went out. And it's kind of vague there, because many of Jesus' mighty deeds are passed over when we think about he just passed from there, or he just went out, or as he was walking. Because we see many of his lessons happen during those exact occasions. You think about when he passed on. Matthew 9, verse 1. He came to Capernaum and he healed a paralytic man. Or what about Matthew 4, beginning in verse 18? When he's just walking by the Sea of Galilee. But that's where he called his disciples to be fishers of men. Or when he passed by a fig tree and he stopped and he took time to give a lesson which would have greater meaning later on. And when we simply pass by the Word of God sometimes, we miss some valuable teachings. Jesus calls us to be diligent, to present ourselves approved. And while I'm not saying there's anything wrong with reading our Bibles, but when we're reading them, we need, we need to be reading them with the intent of learning from them. And so we may pass by something in just a casual reading. Also, look at Jesus. He took every opportunity to teach others the kingdom of God and glorify God. We need to take time to make sure we're getting everything out when we take and read the Bible. Because that's when we come in contact with Jesus. And we don't want him to just pass by. We want to delve in and learn. And we need to take opportunities to express God to others. Take time to explain the kingdom. We were talking about the Bible class this morning, Paul, when he came to Ephesus. However, it's Mark in our account this morning that he says Jesus went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. He was always about the teaching, Mark 2, verse 13. Jesus left the Capernaum. He goes to the Sea of Galilee. Guess what? This action didn't take a lot of effort. Capernaum was on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, he just kind of went outside the city. He didn't go very far. And we're told that the people came to him, and he taught them. And there's a lesson for us. We don't need to go very far to share the gospel. He didn't go any great distance. He didn't teach people. And like Jesus, we can share the gospel in the immediate vicinity of where we are. We can go to our neighbor. We can go to work. Their community center. Wherever it is we sleep with people. I know a brother. He, he's working right now on, on, on converting somebody. And where did he meet him? The gym. Just going to the gym. Talk up conversation with the gentleman. They've been building a, a, a rapport over time. And he's been sharing the gospel with us. He's almost got him ready. In Matthew 28, and verse 19, says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. He didn't tell us how far we needed to go. When we think about that word nations, ethnos is the Greek word, and it means race, a tribe, a foreign, non-Jewish one, pagan, Gentile, heathen, nation, or people. When we think about ethnos, it's not very far off. You can figure out where we get our word ethnic, and it refers to an ethnic group. And there are people all around us who fit this group. 
These descriptions, they're not, we don't need to go very far in order to share his gospel. And it is here along the sea that Jesus sees a tax collector. And he's sitting in his tax office. Matthew 9, verse 9. Now, a little bit about tax collectors. You know, there's still animosity today when you know, people hear IRS. Tax collectors were not well liked in the Roman Empire. And you can well imagine why. It's believed that this tax collector, identified as Matthew, is uh, collecting tariffs. He's collecting tariffs on goods that are passing through Capernaum. And possibly he was working for Herod Antipas, and that is the same one who later is responsible for killing John the Baptizer. But he was the one placed in charge by the Romans. This wasn't the Jews' choice. This is who the Romans picked. And so you know, he wasn't well liked either. Tax collectors, they also, they could search anything other than a Roman lady. And if it wasn't properly declared, guess what? They could seize it. Now imagine you're coming through, you got to pay tariffs. I'm going to hide this, and you know, maybe they won't notice it. Well, if they find it, they can seize it. And the money they collected, it usually went to the local elites. And they were friendly with the Romans. And so tax collectors, as they were the Jews, most of the time, you know, many times, they were also seen by the Jews then as traitors. And they were also known for taking bribes. You know, I'll give you a bribe to lower my tariff. I'll have to pay as much taxes as I, as I bribe you. And John the Baptizer, he even commented on that in Luke 3, verse 13. Speaking of tax collectors, he says, collect no more than what is appointed to you. In other words, don't take a bribe. Don't be dishonest. That was the reputation of tax collectors. And in general, the ones they affected the most were the poor, and so they were despised. And while many saw a tax collector, Jesus saw something else. Jesus is calling one such as Matthew a tax collector. This is actually a glorious example of how God looks at the heart of men and not at the appearance. Like we see with David in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. And we should also uh, do well to know here that we should follow Jesus' example. Where many are blinded by prejudice and social bias, we should see the person. Many would see a store clerk, a salesperson, a bank teller, an agent, a Negro, a policeman, or whatever. Isn't it wonderful that our Lord, when he looks at us, he looks at the heart, and not as a way to Yes. But who we truly are. And we too, we need to get past the external things. When we read of those in the church, especially, there's neither male nor female, there's neither Greek or free. We're all one in Christ. We need to see each other as brothers and sisters. And we need to see the world around us as Jesus sees us, having a love for us. One of the qualities noted in John 13. Is by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And he talks about that we love as he loved us. The calling of Matthew here, it may seem a little abrupt. He just walked along from upon his tax collector. But most likely Matthew, like we saw with Andrew, and Simon, and James, and John, they had been in the presence of Jesus. This wasn't like the first time he saw them, but like them, that was an official call. And he calls him to go with him. And we see Matthew is obedient to that call, just as we saw with Andrew, Simon, James, and John. In fact, Matthew so delighted, he had the dinner. We see this in Matthew 9, beginning in verse 10. And so after calling Matthew to follow him, Luke, it's Luke, in Luke 5, verse 29, it says that Matthew gave him a feast, a great feast in his house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. Now, it's interesting that Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, Matthew doesn't uh, put in his own account that it was he who invited him or, or had this dinner. And it shows some humility upon Matthew's part. 
But the fact that he's having this dinner also shows that he is displaying another Christian trait, and that's hospitality. And so he has this dinner. He invites you know, Jesus. He invites his friends. He invites his co-workers. Whatever it is, his big banquet. Most likely it was in Jesus' honor, although we don't know from the text that that's fully the case. But if he is having this dinner to honor Jesus, again, this shows that trait of honoring his brother more than himself, to have a dinner for somebody. You know, we do it ourselves. We have dinner parties in honor of somebody. We have dinner parties at somebody's birthday, at somebody's anniversary. And we're giving honor to that person. That's not uncommon. What we do see, though, Matthew invited his friends, tax collectors and sinners, as the Pharisees would have described them. Those at the feast, they were the ones that were despised by the religious leaders. They were either irreligious or the ones they saw as low life of society. And to note that the disciples were there too, though. They were eating with them. And when we look to this account in Matthew, it demonstrates one of the best ways of evangelizing. Socializing. This is our, my friend at the gym. You build a rapport with somebody. You get to know somebody. And, and inviting somebody to a meal, this is actually a way of establishing a covenant of friendship. Now, when we invite somebody to have a meal with us, that's a personal occasion. We just don't invite anyone over to our house. We just don't invite anybody out to dinner. And so we're building a, a, a relationship with them. And that's what Matthew's doing. He's got these people he knows, and then he's inviting them to actually get a better look at the Savior, which, as we are to let our light shine, hopefully people are seeing Jesus in us. But Matthew demonstrates what's a great method of introducing our non-Christian friends to our Christian friends also in a very non-intimidating way. And you see that they, those invited, they were invited. That we can't sneak into the service of God. God invites us. He calls us to service to Him. When we come to Him willingly, Jesus would say in John 6, in verse 44, No one can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Those who come to Jesus, who come to Christ, they're influenced to do so. And the influence is by the means of the gospel. The gospel either seen in us as we live our lives, so that we can then share the actual word with them, or in the hearing of the gospel. As Brother Paul tells us, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In Romans 10, verse 17. And it is the gospel that has the power to save Romans 1, verse 16. And in John 6, in verse 45, after saying that no one can come unless the Father draws him, Jesus explains that it's in the hearing of the gospel that one is taught. That is how they come to Christ. Now, each of the synoptic writers, they tell us that this dinner was seen by the scribes and the Pharisees. These are two different groups. They're distinct groups within the Jewish uh, people. Scribes having knowledge of the law, Pharisees who strictly followed traditions, as we read Matthew 9, verse 11. And each was interested in the law, talking about the law of Moses. And because of they scrutinized Jesus, they wanted to see if he was going to do anything that challenged their law, if it challenged their traditions, if there's anything in his behavior they could use against him, as we'll see in future lessons. And that's why they're here. They're looking at they're not at the dinner. They're there outside of looking in. Finding what they can find at fault with Jesus. There's a lesson in this for us as well. We, we often talk about being in the world, but not of the world. Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost. Luke 19, verse 10. And that word lost, it has the meaning of being destroyed. But it also means lost. It has a relation of a shepherd with his flock uh, and to the spiritual destitution and alienation from God. And we see a similar case with the parable of the lost sheep, where the shepherd had to go out and to find the sheep. He leaves the 99, he goes out to find the one sheep. We too, we can sit in the pew praying for the lost to be saved, but until we go out to find them, they're going to remain lost. We also have to remember, it's 
not easy to seek the lost and remain pure of worldliness. But nevertheless, it's what Jesus did, and it's what we must do. One of the saddest conditions of the church is when worldliness creeps into the church. When we fail to show love for others, we fail to demonstrate compassion, not just for the world, but even among our own. The scribes and the Pharisees, they don't question Jesus, but rather his disciples. Matthew 9, verse 11 says, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Man. Immediately they've already drawn the judgment of these people. These collectors and sinners? Why is he eating with them? The religious leaders saw themselves as the most godly. And those that ate at the dinner, the most ungodly. We would never be among them. Think about Jesus who went to save the lost. Oh, I'd never be among them. I wouldn't associate with They also were attempting to drive a wedge in Jesus' disciples. They were trying to get the disciples by soliciting, why, why, is, your, why is your teacher eating tax collectors and sinners? Trying to drive a wedge in them. Trying to get them to kind of cater over to their uh, bias, their prejudice. On another occasion, Jesus comments on how John the baptizer, neither eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bitter, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. John chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. They criticized John the baptizer for not doing the very things that they were now criticizing Jesus for doing. They weren't satisfied either way. There's a simple truth. Those rebellious to God will always find excuse to refuse the call. We talked about in the Bible class this morning, similar situation. Those that are against Christ will always have an excuse, no matter what. Matthew and Mark say Jesus heard them. Luke says he answered them. Uh, it's unclear if Jesus heard them or the disciples came to him and told them. But what is apparent is that this is not one of those miraculous times where he neither gawks and demonstrated his omniscience, but he answers your question. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And Jesus, as he often does, he's drawing an illustration from life. We know that when we go to the doctor. We go to the doctor when we're sick. When we're feeling well, you know, unless you're having an annual checkup, or if you're like me, I don't go to the doctor at all unless I'm sick. Well, he says, those that are sick, they go to a doctor. Well, those who are spiritually sick, they go to the master. They go to Jesus. The irony here is that the scribes and the Pharisees, they were some of the ones that were most spiritually sick, and they failed to see it. And at another time, Jesus says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to deserve, that observe it. They're in a place of authority. They're, they're speaking from the law. Whatever they say, you do it. But then he says, but do not do according to their works. Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3. Jesus would also explain how they can take and put all these weighty matters of the law on people, but they wouldn't lift their own finger to do it. So what they say, yes, do that, but don't do as they do. All, including the scribes and the Pharisees, who saw themselves as righteous, they were in need of saving. They, as well as the tax collectors and the sinners, they had access to the Savior. He's right there. If they would only humble themselves and lay their prejudice aside. And it, it's also sad that those who acknowledge that the sinners were lost, that they would be the ones who seek to help them. Can you imagine? They'd rather look down on those who are lost than to try and help them. That's how far off they were. And why Jesus constantly was correcting them. He says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. 
For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Oh, we can go through all the motions. We can look to the world and appear righteous. Just like the Pharisees. You know, they dress the dress. They walk the walk. They talk the talk. They were seen in the best places. They love to be called rabbi. But inwardly, they were right. They were spiritually dead. They are all about the show. He says, I desire mercy. What the word of this means. And he's quoting from Hosea 6 and verse 6. And it's sad that they didn't recognize that he was comparing their rejected condition to the reprobate priest of Hosea's time. Jesus had come to redeem man from sin. And a prerequisite of that is to acknowledge that we're in sin. We have to acknowledge that we're in sin, that we're lost, and we're in need of saving. Jesus here, he doesn't say that the Pharisees were righteous. That's not what he's saying. Their sins were well known to all but themselves. They judged themselves unworthy of salvation because they wouldn't acknowledge Jesus as the Savior. And even more, they wouldn't even acknowledge that they needed Savior. What a sad condition. Then there's a question that comes about about feasting. Next, we see this question arrive with the fasting and the Pharisees and John's disciples. Uh, they say to Jesus, why do, you, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Matthew 9, and verse 14. That's a legitimate question they pose to Jesus. Following this meal at Matthew's house, while the Pharisees uh, and then obviously John's disciples were fasting in observance of, of the customary feast, those at Matthew's house were not fasting or feasting. It says it's a fair question. Why do you feast when we fast? The site of here most likely being some of the scribes and Pharisees had uh, spoken to. They were trying, they were trying to drive that wedge in there. So some of John's disciples that had followed Jesus, uh, you see they had some success in stirring up trouble. That was what they were about. They liked to stir up trouble. And so they had a little bit of success, success here. And so this question is posed to Jesus. And John had endorsed Jesus. Now, these are John's disciples. You know, we left John, we followed you, but why don't you do what we do? Well, Jesus needs to address this situation, and so he does so very uniquely. Uh, fasting is often a sign of mourning, and so Jesus uses the illustration of a wedding. And in John 3, in verse 29, John the baptizer had referred to Jesus as the bridegroom. And he said, But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the, bride, because of the bridegroom's voice. Oftentimes, when there was fasting or there was mourning, <clears throat> it would be put aside for a wedding. You know, sometimes we, we plan a wedding. Even today, we plan a wedding, and our wedding is set for a date. We book the hall, everything's in place, we got the caterer, we can't really change it. We have a wedding. But if it happens in life, somebody passes away. And it falls in that same time frame. But we'll put aside that morning to rejoice with the wedding. And that's what Jesus is talking about. That oftentimes fasting and mourning, they, they were set aside for a wedding. Also, they had been fasting because they were looking for deliverance from God. <clears throat> and that deliverance was right in front of them. It, it, he was here, the bridegroom was present. It, it's not a time for mourning. We, we lay that aside when we're at a wedding. We had also the, the music starts playing, you'll hear it comes. Well, the bridegroom, he's present. He's standing there. And we rejoice in that moment. We put that mourning aside. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. And this is a time not for mourning, but it's a wedding in a spiritual sense. Soon, there would be the time for mourning. Jesus would be crucified. He'd be laid in a tomb for three days. That's the time for mourning, but not now. And Jesus then spoke a parable to them. He says, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment 
For the pants pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Matthew 9, verse 16. You know, I haven't done it in many, many years, but I remember when I was a kid, I need to wear the knees out of my jeans. My mom would put a patch on it. If you put a patch on an old pair of jeans that's new, you don't pre-treat that or anything, when you wash it again, you know what happens? The patch shrinks. And when it shrinks, it tears away from the hole that was made to fix. It does more damage. And so Jesus is making the same comparison, this new cloth that hasn't been shrunk. You put it on a, an old garment, you wash it the first time, it's going to tear away, it's going to cause damage. And the point he's making is that he didn't come to put a patch on the old law. Christianity was something completely new and different. I'm not trying to fix an old system. And then he says, nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled, the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Matthew 9, verse 17. Now the imagery here is you've got this old wineskin, and it had fermented wine in it, or grape juice. It's fermented. It's gone bad. And what has happened is the wineskin has become hard and brittle. Now, if you try and reuse that, and what happens when you put the new wine in, it's going to break. It's going to burst. Anyone here in Florida, we're well familiar with what the sun does to plastics. You go, you touch a piece of plastic, come out in the sun, it just brittle, it cracks, it falls apart in your hand. That's what he's talking about. You put that new wine in that old skin, it's just going to break. It's going to fall apart. Also, you wouldn't put new into old that has been fermented because it's going to spoil the new. Another time, Jesus talked about leaven. How there's leaven in the whole lump. You put that new into that old, it's contaminated. Luke says in Luke 5, verse 38, but new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. Remember, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. Matthew 5, verse 17. That old system, it was valid up to the cross, but a new system is coming. He's not putting a new system into the old system. This is a whole new reboot. God's making a new covenant with man. And Jesus wasn't about putting his teachings into the old ways. That old system of Judaism, the pagan religions, all those things that existed before, they cannot be merged with Christianity. We can't take and have you know, have it your way. Take a piece of this. Take a piece of that. I was talking to Sister Anita this morning. So I saw a coffee mug. It says, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. Well, we take and try and merge things together. That's what's going to happen. Things are going to be out of context. They're not going to go together. They're not going to work. Luke says, and no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. Luke 5, verse 39. And what he's talking about, there was a reluctance among many to accept the new. They were reluctant to, to accept Christ. They, they were not, they were hesitant to give up that old religion for the new. Now there were many that embraced it fully, but some were hesitant. They were reluctant. And that's what he's talking about. And today, when we take and we study the gospel of people, we're, we're bringing them out of other religions or out of atheism. They're reluctant to give up what they do. Old is comfortable. New, oh, you know, this is something I mean, I gotta embrace. I, 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 there, there's, there's, a, there's something required of me now. I can't just do what I did before. I gotta learn new things. I gotta do new things. And so there's reluctance. Well, this morning we have seen that while Jesus may accept us where we are, He by no means expects us to stay. We are. He calls us to a new life, a better life, a life of following Him. We talked about in the Bible class this morning that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The gospel is recognized as the way. <coughs> Saul was persecuting those who were of the way. He was teaching the way when he became the Apostle Paul. Being a Christian is a way of life. It's not something you just take out of the closet and put it on a Sunday morning. It's something we wear all the time. 
And in following Jesus, we need to make some radical changes sometimes in our lives. Just as Matthew and the other disciples, they left their very jobs, their occupations, walked away. Jesus also shows us we don't have to go very far to evangelize. He just went outside the city. <coughs> Matthew, he shows us a very valuable technique in evangelizing. Seek those you have first. And while we must seek the lost, we must be careful not to be drawn away by them. You know, there is a, a great influence uh, sometimes we're in the world to go along with the world. But we've been called out of the world. And we have to be a greater influence on the world than it is on us. One of my instructors in Florida School of Preaching, he told a countless of lady he did that was a preacher. And he was going to the bars sitting at the bar and trying to convert drunks. That sounds real good, don't it? You can imagine what happens over time. I'll have a Coke. I'll have a rum and Coke. Just give me a whiskey. And they were having a greater influence on that preacher than he was having on them. We draw too close to the world or we seek the lost. What we need to be doing is growing closer to the Lord through our study, through our attendance, through our associating with fellow Christians. Like Matthew does, he didn't go to the bar. He invited them to his house where the disciples were with him. See, there's strength in numbers. We don't want to gang up on somebody that but also we want to be careful that we're not taking it and being like that man in the bar and them having a greater influence on us than not being like that. And we see that should have in Jesus, we should rejoice. We should let the, the, the those things that are around us, you know, not draw us into the not act of mourning. I know the past year. Boy, it's been kind of a situation where we, we've kind of felt like mourning. We've kind of felt despair. But we have Christ. We have the greatest thing in the world. Gene and I were talking, and it's sad that many in the church have a fear of dying. We shouldn't be afraid of dying. If we have Christ, we can rejoice. I think of Paul, he thought of dying. Oh, it was a far better thing to be with Christ. But if I remain, well, that's good too, because I can win more souls to Christ. The attitude we need. Today we have Christ. We have Christianity. But in being new, we can be made new in Christ. And this morning, if you've been made new in Christ, is the world seeing that? Do you display that? everywhere you go, that you're a new creation. There's something different about you than those around you. And this morning, if you have not been made new, well, Christ calls us by the gospel. We have Jesus. He has come. He has died for our sins. He has provided the means of salvation. And he has detailed what we need to do to be saved through his word. Believe it. Must believe that Jesus is the Christ. Believing that He is the Christ and He died for our sins, it calls us to repentance. This is acknowledging that our way doesn't work. And we need to give up the proper way. We need to turn to Him. And then we need to confess our faith that we believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And then He calls us to be baptized. And here He has told us. This is his will. It's where he will unite us with Christ. He will wash away our sins and he will unite us together <coughs> as with his church. If we just be humble and obedient. And then he promises us a home in life, a home in heaven, if we remain faithful. Remaining faithful means doing all the things that he has commanded, following the way he has set before us. This morning, we offer an invitation. If you are a member of the body of Christ and you have sinned in your life and you 
needs to be addressed publicly. We offer you that opportunity. It's private sense between you and God. So don't let it go unresolved. And if you're not a member of the body of Christ, and we just talked about that, we offer you that invitation. If you're ready to speak, to confess your faith and be baptized into Christ, we'd like to help you to do that. However, we help anyone this morning. We invite you to come forward as we stand and say.